Reading today comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails, and place my fingers in the marks of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger in here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. You notice that at the end of this scripture it says that uh, not everything that God has done is written in this book. And that was just in that moment. In the first century, imagine how many stories have been written that have not been written down. I mean, written on our hearts, on the lives of church, on the lives of living examples of faith, people who have come before us as followers of Christ. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. In the vernacular of those who follow the lectionary, we sometimes just say Easter 2. Thank you for being here, and I mean that. Because most people don't show up on Easter 2. Easter 1 was enough. <laughs> Should get us for a couple of weeks. All the extra time and energy and music must, it'll hold us through. <laughs> but even if your lilies or flowers that you took home last week are beginning to wilt or already planted outside in your garden, and your Easter brunch has settled into places you wished it wouldn't have, and family has finally returned to their home, we do have something to be thankful for. Easter isn't over. It's just begun. In fact, Easter this year is going to run all the way to June 9th, almost as long as school. So in the meantime, what do we do? We don't give up on Easter. We try to figure out what is this this continuing story of Easter going to say over the next few weeks together? Are we going to share the experiences together on Sunday? Tell the stories of Jesus. Remember the stories of the disciples who were sometimes faithful and sometimes not, who struggled to believe, sometimes had doubts, but eventually came along until we get to Pentecost, where finally the disciples get it. And they declare the story of Jesus Christ his life, death, and resurrection as one mystery that we proclaim as faith and becomes the foundation of who we are as the church. If we have an Easter too, well, we actually have a lot more than that, don't we? Because we'll come back a year from now and do it all again. Over and over again. Proclaiming the new life of God. Proclaiming that death is never, ever the final answer. And it is certainly not the end, but it is an opportunity to begin anew. For those of us here who are United Methodists, we realize that we've made some critical decisions over the last weeks and months. Two months ago, our general conference, which represents the whole church worldwide, came together and made decisions on behalf of all United Methodists. 
The one thing, as we went to the listening session yesterday with the bishop, and there were, I think, 16 of us from this church who came. Thank you. What we heard from the bishop was, the church is never going to be the same again. We don't know what that means, which is what he also said, but we do know that the church as we know it is not going to be the same in the future. The Wesleyan or Methodist movement, as it has been intoned for a number of years, is in a precarious moment. But in the midst of that, we just keep celebrating Easter. It's an interesting counterpoint, isn't it, for us? We don't know, as the old hymn says, what tomorrow brings, but we know who holds tomorrow. And I don't think there's anybody here, I hope not, that can't trust in that. That's our desire. That's our story, is that whatever it is, we're going to move through this together. We're going to figure it out. But how we live into moments of doubt and decision, well, honestly, we were taught by the founder of the Methodist Church, Wesley, how to do that. John Wesley was clear that there are ways to and ways we shouldn't discern the way of God. I'm grateful because what moments of doubt sometimes cause us to do is for us to have moments of indecision. But I'm hoping as Easter people that these moments that we are struggling and wondering what is Methodism going to look like in the future will be moments of decision. A modern scholar of Wesley and theologian of Methodist way coined a phrase that we call Wesley's quadrilateral. If you've been in the Methodist Church a while, you've probably heard that phrase. Outler describes four distinct methods or tools that Christians should be using for marking our way forward as people of faith. They are these, scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. They call it a quadrilateral because there are four and there's a kind of balancing act that goes along and it connects it all together as we try to discern God's way and will for our life. My hope today and over the next few weeks is that we might strengthen our quads. And I don't mean in the traditional sense. That'd be good too. Having better quads is good. But understanding how to discern faith together in a way that builds each other up, that strengthens our resolve to be in this together, that helps us to be the body of Christ for the future of the church is extremely important. This balanced approach to decisions and conversation in our church and in our denomination will help us prove how we might be our best self together and our best selves. We'll need to be looking how the church has grown and changed and divided and united and thought over generations. You know that the church does that regularly, right? The church of Jesus Christ has been seen in many kinds of denominations and ways and ways of doing business together and ways of worshiping together. And we've made it through. That is a part of the tradition of the church. But as we discern what ways are those things that we ought to continue and those that need to go away, we immerse ourselves in scriptures. We read the good book that we've been given to instruct us and to help us how to understand how to move forward. And so we have two pieces of that quadrilateral. The third is that um, we will need to discuss together our experiences of God and our experiences of life and our experiences of this world, and how those engage together. We don't study the Scripture in a vacuum. We study it in the world, and we study it with fellow Christians as we begin to try to figure out the next step in our faith together, and our faith as individual disciples of Jesus Christ. And finally, and it's the one that I most treasure about the Methodist Church, is that we will have a reasoned discussion based on things we know and things we learn. Through the church, through science, through our discussions together, and through other people's experiences and ours together. That's what reason means, that it, that it's, it makes sense. 
that's not out there somewhere, so far removed from society that we do not have connection with it. So now let's get into the story that we have in front of us today. Our story today in John's Gospel is a step into scriptures that may help us realize how change happens and how different people respond to the way and the will and the work that we do as Christians together. I want to start with Mary Magdalene. She's not really in the story, but she is if you go back just a few verses. We shared some of her story last week. And of course, we may have different takes on Mary Magdalene because the honest truth is there isn't a whole lot about her, though it sounds like she was extremely involved in the early church. But Mary Magdalene, I think in this story, could certainly be considered, though part of the new emerging followers of Jesus, an other, an outsider, from the sense that she was a woman and she was leading in the church. This was something that hadn't and wasn't happening in the communities of faith of that patriarchal time. So the first witness and the only one who sees and believes to begin with is Mary Magdalene. She went to the tomb first. She has the first experience, we're told, of the risen Christ. Has, a, has a, an experience of the presence of Jesus in her life after she has seen Jesus die. She runs to tell the others her insight. And guess what happens in the group of men that are sitting there? She's dismissed. Just an idle tale. They won't believe her witness. They have to see it for themselves. Now understand the context of this passage in John is we're in a, the Gospel of John probably being written late into the first century, maybe even at the tail end of the first century after Jesus' birth. And the early church is trying to figure out, can you be a follower of Jesus if you never saw him? If you never heard him teach? And so the early church wants clearly to say that it is possible to have an experience of God in Jesus Christ without ever physically having seen Jesus. And so put into the story is a guiding principle for us. And in fact, Jesus in the story says, maybe those who haven't seen and yet believed are even more blessed, understand who God is even better than those who have seen and believe. Tom dema Thomas demands to see and to feel Jesus and to know. But the truth is, when we are in changing and turbulent waters, we can't always see perfectly. We don't know, except by faith, by trusting that when we take the step, God will be on the other side of that step. The most immediate followers of Jesus, when they got well, when they weren't sure, when they were struggling, they weren't sure what had happened, when they were discouraged, what did they do? They ran to a room and they locked the doors behind them. You cannot escape this image in the Gospels in the most immediate response to the resurrection. The witness of our scripture is that people who are scared lock the doors. The question is, when we lock the doors, do we lock our mind? Do we lock our hearts? And lock the doors? Is this about whether we're afraid or not? Or is it about whether we're going to be faithful or not? And what does that look like as a community of faith? A community of faith, no matter how fearful, cannot escape the witness and the presence of the living Christ. Now you notice that the disciples went and locked the doors, but what did Jesus do? Jesus made himself present to those who were afraid and locked in and locked up and locking others out in order that they might have an experience of the living Christ, each one of those followers, for him or herself. Jesus just shows up. I hope that you will know if you're feeling fearful or struggling today that no matter what you do, no matter how you try to keep Jesus out of your life, Jesus will continue to show up. And what does he do? He says, peace. He says, though they're trying to throw him out, they're not sure what to do with him, he says, peace. I want to have peace with you. Jesus shows up in our fear. Jesus shows up in our hopelessness. Jesus shows up in our times of grief. Jesus even shows up for Thomas in his doubt. And then Jesus breathes on them. 
Now you remember that, um, that breath in the scriptures, in the, and especially in the Hebrew, it's the same word for spirit. So when you talk about the ruach, that, that creative spirit that blew over the waters of creation, when we see Jesus walk into the room and people are stifled and unsure how to move, Jesus breathes on them. He's breathing creation into them. He's making something new where they see no possibility of a next step. Jesus shows up in our fear. He grants us peace and he breathes his spirit into us. Recently, we've had the joy of watching on FaceTime periodically our two new babies, our grandbabies. And the phone will ring and, and you'll see FaceTime and you get all excited. You're never quite sure what's going to show up on the screen. And then, boom, there's a baby face. Sometimes it's mom or dad holding them and said, I've had enough, I needed to call somebody. Other times the baby's happy and smiling right back at you. But one of the experiences that we've had several times is, uh, is the baby being a little fussy and then mom or dad blowing in their face. And watching that child just like, first in a kind of confused response, say, what's that? You don't really know what's going on in their mind, you're just trying to guess. And then they flutter their, or they lick at the air because they can't figure out what it is and then break into a smile. I was imagining this scene with Jesus kind of like that and their frustration and they were crying in the corner and Jesus comes in and breathes on them. And at first they're not sure what to do with one whom they've rejected coming back and saying, I forgive you and you're blessed and breathing on them, giving them God's spirit but fear can turn to delight. Ends can turn into new beginnings. Tension can actually turn into stronger bonds of community when we allow it to inform and help us to have honest conversations with one another. As we strengthen our, our connection with biblical witness, I would encourage us as a family of faith to take the scriptures more seriously than we do literally. And what I mean by that is for us to have good, solid Bible study together. To not try to prove our point by simply speaking one little word, but to sit down with each other and pour over scriptures and allow the scriptures to, to paint us, to create us. The danger of the passage from 2 Timothy, though I put it in here today to remind us that even the Bible says about itself that it's really important for us to study scriptures and allow them to rest in us, is that we can't use the scriptures as a cudgel. We can't use it to hurt others. The scriptures are, it says, to encourage, to inform, and help us understand God's way and will in our life. They are instructive. We're told that they were inspired, which means that that, that spirit that Jesus was blowing on his disciples was blown on them as they were writing and thinking about who God was and their experience of God, and we find that in scriptures. Does it mean every word that they thought, every instruction they gave was perfect? Maybe not. But it does say they, like us, were grappling with God, struggling with the next step, and Jesus showed up and breathed on them. The scripture is an indispensable instructional tool. The stories of faith give us kind of a way to engage with the, the trials that others have suffered and and gotten through, and the joys that they've celebrated, and the ways they've seen God move. When we are told that scriptures are God-breathed or inspired, it means that the Holy Spirit is involved in scriptures. But it also means, I think, if they're inspired, that the Holy Scriptures are involved in us as we read the scriptures, as we hear the scriptures, as we study and discuss the scriptures. This suggests that God still speaks. This is our Wesleyan tradition. We believe that God continues to speak in and through us and in our conversation and that the Holy Spirit is among us. It, we are not a dead sect. In fact, that's why we were formed, so that we wouldn't become a dead sect. It's exactly what John Wesley said. It is always tempting to face our fears by, by locking doors and building walls. But Jesus shows up anyway and looks us in the faith and 
face and breathes on us and says, put aside your fears, peace be with you. Lovingly spreading his spirit, quelling our fears, witnessing to his love in the midst of our death, reminding us a second time today that even death is not the end. It's Easter 2. And next week will be Easter 3. And the next week, Easter 4. And then Easter 5. So that we won't forget that death does not have the final word. So I invite you, over the next few weeks and months, to strengthen your quads, your engagement with Scripture, the learning of the historic church and its traditions and how it made decisions about ways forward in the past, the experience of the Holy Spirit that is different, new in each of us, and the engagement of critical thinking and good conversation in the context of vulnerability, trusting each other enough to say and to share how we feel and what we know and what we don't know with one another. I believe we'll find new life as we relinquish control of the church, when we allow Jesus to open our hearts, open our minds, and keep those doors open. Because we're a family of faith that cares about the whole world. In our end will truly be our beginning. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us now as we wonder together about our future faith, as we wonder together about the world that little William will grow up in, that our new members will grapple with as they come into this family of faith, as we have conversations with people we've never had them with before. We are grateful for each person here today for each of our experiences of you, God, and for your Holy Spirit and your guidance. Now let us pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time we'll receive our morning offerings. It'll include some baskets going around for our hunger offering to support Supper House, an important ministry of our church that helps to feed hungry people in the larger Lakeshore community.